Welcome to our final public lecture of 2017. Uh, thank you for braving the fires to come tonight. Fortunately, hopefully it won't be too bad in terms of particulate in the air, so we'll still have good observing. Um, if you didn't see when you came in, we have a new schedule for the next six months. Uh, we've set the dates for our public lecture series that happens like this one uh, once a month with stargazing afterwards. And we also have our next six months of Astronomy on Tap events at a local bar with informal talks. So those are both uh, on the two sides of the, of the flyer when you came in. And you're free to take those. There's also some cool posters of um, the Myra variable star plowing through the interstellar medium. And so you get this really cool bow shock and, and such. Anyway, so feel free to, feel free to take those. Uh, it, yes, as it's being held up here in the front. Um, if this is your first time, essentially what will happen is after I finish talking in a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll have our speaker uh, speak for roughly half an hour. And then afterwards, you're encouraged to, to do two things until 9 o'clock. You can stick around in here, and we'll have an expert Q&A panel with many members of the department who study different aspects of astrophysics who are happy to answer whatever questions you have in the field of astrophysics and such. Uh, We'll also have stargazing outside on the fields directly behind this building on the north fields. And you can get to those if you walk out the front and then walk down the path to the side. And there will be a flashing light that will lead you onto the north fields. And we'll have telescopes set up there. I believe tonight we're looking at the double cluster, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Pleiades cluster, which are all pretty, pretty stunning views. So. Uh, so that'll, both events will be going uh, until 9 o'clock, so you're encouraged to go back and forth and do whatever you want, or leave if you want, but hopefully you'll, you'll stick around. And, uh, oh, and in terms of using the field, please, no littering, pets, cigarettes, uh, food, drink, uh, high heels, because you can damage the, tur the artificial turf and then we don't get to use the field anymore. So please, uh, if you want to go out there with heels, just walk barefoot. It's very comfortable. I've walked barefoot out there before. I haven't walked in high heels out there before. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all of my announcements. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Gao Tenyanant. He is a graduate student here, a third-year graduate student. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Harvey Mudd College, just east of here and has been working on brown dwarf research, observational brown dwarf research with Dimitri Mawe for the last couple of years. So please welcome Gao Tenyamon. Tenyamon. Well, thank you, Cameron, for the introduction. And uh, hello. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming here to our last event of 2017. And my name is Gao Tenyamon, and I would like to talk to you today about brown dwarfs, these oddball astronomical objects that have mass not quite at, as much as a star, but definitely more than planets. Um, I will start by discussing what a brown dwarf is and uh, uh, why as astronomers starting in the 1960s uh, already knew that these things should exist out there somewhere. And then we will go through the long and arduous quest for finding one of these the real brown dwarf in, uh, on the sky. It took 30 years, but finally in 1995, we found the first brown dwarf. And now today, thanks to all the all sky survey out there, we, knew, uh, we know more than 2,000 brown dwarfs. And I will finish by um, talking a little bit about how, what, what we know about these things t today and what are left to be done in the future. So first of all, when we look into our own solar system, this is the very beautiful rendition of a uh, true scale model of our solar system. And the first thing you will notice is that the sun is enormous, especially in comparison to these teeny tiny planets. If you zoom in to this one corner, you notice immediately that even for the biggest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, is teeny tiny in comparison to the sun. And the same story goes with the mass. The sun is actually uh, uh, around 1,000 times more massive than Jupiter. So you might want to ask, well, what if we look outside of the solar system? Do we see objects with mass somewhere between uh, that of the sun and that of Jupiter? 
And indeed, when we look outside of the solar system, we see smaller and smaller and smaller stars. Now, the question is, when you shrink the star in mass, when does it become something more like Jupiter and not like a star anymore? What does the intermediate uh, object be between here and here look like? And to answer these questions, we have to start by looking at the, uh, the physical difference between stars and planets. So the key difference comes down to whether or not the object you're looking at can produce energy on its own or not. And the star can produce energy, and it does so by having this reaction called the nuclear fusion reaction inside its core. And what you have here is four hydrogen nuclei running into each other at very, very high energy and combined through some crazy physics that I'm not going, uh, going to talk about in details today, but feel free to ask me afterward, and then spit, uh, spits out uh, a helium nucleus. If you take the helium nucleus and put it on a scale, you will find that the mass of helium is actually a little bit less than uh, the mass of the four hydrogens you put in. And Einstein would tell you that this missing mass is actually emitted as, a, uh, as energy according to the E equals mc square uh, equation. And it's this emitted energy from the reaction that is powering stars. So how does the, a, a star acquire this nuclear reactor in the first place, right? So stars form typically by a collapse of a giant uh, gas cloud in, in, in space. So first of all, you have this big clump of cloud that is starting co to collapse under its own gravity. And as it collapses, the density and temperature inside uh, this, this cloud will start to rise. So one thing you need the, the, the main thing you need for a nuclear reaction to start is that you need a lot of hydrogen close to each other, so you need high density. You also need these hydrogens to be flying into each other at very high speed, so you need high temperature. So what you need, the final goal for this process is that you need to get to the density and temperature high enough to start nuclear fusion. So for a star, this process, of course, goes through and eventually produce um, nuclear fusion in the core. And when nuclear fusion starts, it emits so much energy, it can cancel out the gravitational collapse of the cloud. So once a star reaches this point, it becomes stable and stay like that for a very, very long time. Now, uh, this final density and temperature is actually a, a function of how much mass or how much gravity you have in the first place. And you can imagine already that if your gas cloud gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the final density and temperature will never rise to the high level you need for, for nuclear fusion, and it will stop somewhere in the middle. So this is uh, exactly what, uh, what astrophysicists figured out in, in 1962. The work, is, uh, the work done was led by um, uh, uh, Shiv Kumar, and um, in his publication, he showed a detailed calculation that if your initial gas cloud is less than 8% the mass of the sun, the final blob of gas you get will actually not have nuclear fusion inside. And the details of this calculation have to do with uh, some detailed quantum theory. Um, in, uh, again, another thing you can ask me afterward, but uh, briefly, for these low mass objects, in the final product, the electrons in the core actually get too close to each other to the point that you can't compress it down anymore. And that, thing, uh, that unwillingness of electrons to get closer to each other is actually what propped this object up. This happens before you reach the density and temperature required for nuclear fusion. So for this kind of object, lower than 8% mass of the sun, you never get uh, any nuclear fusion, you never become a star. And this is what we call a brown dwarf. Now, it's cool, it's good. The theory seems to work well, so why don't we just go out, drive through our telescopes, and look out for a brown dwarf in, in the real universe? There are some problems. So a brown dwarf, right after the collapse, will be, become quite hot, around 2,000 degrees. So this is... Uh, in uh, comparison to low-mass stars, so we should be able to see them. 
The problem is this. These, these two objects, one is a brown dwarf and one is a low mass star. Can you tell which is which? <laughs> Turns out it's very difficult as they have uh, identical colors in, in photographs and also if, even if you take the light and, and put it through a, a prism to get a rainbow out of it or we call it spectrum and look at signatures in these spectrum, they also look identical and, and indeed these, these two things are classified as something similar. So how do you tell apart a brown dwarf from a young, uh, I mean a young brown dwarf from a low mass star? It turns out to be really difficult as a answer key here. This one is a brown dwarf, this one is a low mass star. So one thing that tells you immediately that you have a brown dwarf is that if you measure the mass somehow and figure out that the mass is lower than 8% of the sun, right? Same, sounds easy, but in practice, trying to weigh something light years away is very difficult. Now for stars, it turns out that mass is actually quite relatively easier to, to measure, and you can do this by measuring the color of the object by looking at the, uh, looking at the star in different, um, in different wavelengths using different filters, and you can work out using your complicated model that we know quite well to come out at the mass of the star. And we can only do this, again, because stars have nuclear reaction in the core, so it's very stable. We don't have that for brown dwarf. And as a result, brown dwarf is born very fairly hot and then cools down as they age. And that's a problem because even though we have color which we can, we can observe easily, you can't get mass unless you know how old it is. And if you think mass is difficult to measure, age is actually even more difficult to measure for, uh, for objects like these. So I will come back at this a little later on how, how do you go around this problem. But for now, you can also think, well, if the young brown dwarfs are so difficult to, uh, to differentiate from stars, why don't we go around and actually look for a lower mass or, uh, or older brown dwarfs, which are definitely cooler than a normal star, right? That's another problem. Old brown dwarfs are really, really faint. This is an image of some sort of an a old brown dwarf in the visible light that you and I can see. And the problem is that you can't see it. It's supposed to be here. Right? You can't see it. It's, it's not there. And, the, and, and the, the, the reason is that because the surface temperature is so low, most of the radiation comes out in the infrared. So you need an infrared camera to see it. So this is an image uh, from a sky survey. And you can see overlaid here. The brown dwarf is pretty, pretty obvious here. So you might, see, you might say, oh, why, why don't we just uh, take images using infrared camera instead? Another problem is that this is you know, 1970s and 80s, so uh, most advanced infrared detectors have like 10 pixels. So you can't do this yet. OK, so these are, now, now I hope that you understand why the search for a real brown dwarf took so long since the, uh, the first theoretical prediction. And the reason is because it's a difficult thing to do. So we come up with some, some strategies. So let me first list out the problem. The sky is big and the telescope and the detectors are small. So if you want to take images of everything on the sky, it will take forever. Another problem for, uh, is that for young brown dwarfs, you need to know age, which is difficult to measure in order to know mass. So we have two strategies. The first one, look in clusters. The reason behind this is that uh, if you have a stellar cluster, these are objects where all the members are born roughly at the same time and are still staying quite close to each other on the sky. So you kill both um, in one stone, you know the age, and also you don't need a huge area on the sky. You can just focus on this one cluster. Or alternatively, you can do strategy two, look around nearby stars. The reason behind this is because we know that a lot of stars around, uh, around the solar neighborhood actually are not like the sun in that they live in binary systems or systems involving more than two stars. So it's not unreasonable to assume that some of the systems out there will have one component 
as a brown dwarf instead of a star. And then again, if you look around nearby star, it's slightly easier to measure age. And also, you don't, have, you don't need a big detector. You can just point to different stars. OK, so you have two strategies in hand. How did that work out? So for the first strategy, looking at clusters, it turns out that one of the perfect places uh, one of the perfect places to do this is actually the Pleiades, which we will get to look at uh, with our tiny telescope tonight. You will not get to see any brown dwarf, but it's the same cluster. <laughs> so the work has been done by actually a number of groups, one of them uh, uh, here at Caltech. But the first group to publish an um, sort of like a bona fide brown dwarf example was uh, a Spanish group using a telescope in, in the, in the uh, Canary Islands. It's called a Tidal One, and it was detected as a very, very faint and very, very red object in the Pleiades. And remember, this is the, uh, the young and hot end of the brown dwarf distribution. So even though it's, it's uh, young and supposed to be hot and bright, it's still really, really dim in comparison with normal stars. So they detected this object in the Pleiades. And because the Pleiades is a nearby cluster that has been studied very, very well, we actually know the age of the all the stars in this system to a very, very good uh, precision. So they uh, spend time confirming that this object is indeed belonging to the, to the cluster and not just something in front or behind the cluster. They confirm that and calculate the mass. And sure enough, it came out well below 8% mass of, the, mass of the sun. And they actually pinpointed to between 2 and 3% mass of the sun. So this is the first object that uh, anyone can, uh, was able to, con to confirm that must be a brown dwarf. There are a number of other objects like this. One is called a, a PPL 15, which is from Paloma Pleiades 15. The, uh, the discovery is actually uh, made with this telescope right here. <laughs> and there, there are a couple more groups that may, uh, made the same, same discovery uh, using the first technique of looking into clusters and they found a bunch of young and relatively bright brown dwarfs. So the cluster strategy worked. What about nearby star? Right, so there's a lot of work done, again, by multiple groups around the world. And, but one that got to publish first is actually the group here at Caltech led by uh, Shri Kukhani, uh, along with uh, his uh, postdoc and graduate students using the 60-inch telescope on, on Paloma Observatory to look around nearby star. Now, this telescope has a, a, quite a special instrument. And it's called a, chrono, uh, 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 a coronagraph. What it does is that it has a tiny dot inside the instrument that blocks out the light of the main star. So trust me, this is already blocked out. Stars are really bright. <laughs> But by block, blocking out some part of the starlight, it allows you to detect dimmer, fainter things uh, in orbit nearby. And indeed, in, uh, uh, in October 1994, they spotted this one uh, tiny companion to a uh, very cold star called Gliese 229. And this is a nearby star. So creatively, as we all do, we named it 229b. And a year later, they get a confirmation image from Hubble Space Telescope that show that, it's sure enough, there's something here. And because it's a year later, if this is something in front or behind, it will be gone. But because it's still here, we know that it's actually uh, something in orbit around the star. Also, in, uh, in late 1999, they took this telescope again with a newly built infrared spectrograph, point at it, and take a spectrum. So a spectrum is basically just the brightness as a function of wavelength. And you can see that this object, Gliese 229b, has a very remarkable spectrum. So typically, if you look at a star spectrum, what you see is uh, a broad and continuous feature with some dips and bumps. But what you see on the 229b is that you see huge absorption features and just small peaks and then huge absorptions everywhere. One of the astronomers, Keith Matthew, that was on the observatory with, uh, along with his team, 
suddenly realized that it looks identical to the spectrum of Jupiter. And so they also took the spectrum of Jupiter, compared it, and, and sure enough, they looked identical. These lines here are the keys. So li the, the vertical lines on top here are where you expect absorption features from methane to start. And what you have to understand is that methane is a very volatile species. They will not exist in, at any temperature above 1,000 Kelvin. And what we know from, from uh, you know, stellar evolution is that stars, regardless of how small they are, they're always hotter than 1,000 Kelvin. So what they, what they show here is that we found something that is colder than any star possible. Therefore, it must be a brown dwarf. So this is the first uh, detection and confirmation of uh, a brown dwarf that has methane in it. Now, we get two or three brown dwarfs. But in order to study this whole class of objects as a population, you can't rely on five known objects. So what you need is more and more. What happened in the late 1990s is that large detectors become more readily available, both in the, uh, in the optical and in the near infrared. So what people start to do is strapping it behind a uh, moderately sized telescope and take photographs of everything on the sky. So this is the uh, invention of um, all-sky surveys. The most monumental all-sky surveys for brown dwarf detections are uh, the, the two-micron all-sky survey, a two-mass, that has two telescopes, one in the north in the US and one, I believe, in Chile. And they photograph the whole, the whole sky in the near-infrared wave band. The same survey is done by a European group. And the survey is called Deep Near Infrared Survey, or DENIS. And I believe the Europeans don't believe in making up signs, so they actually didn't have logo. And uh, finally, just to mention, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is also a very, very uh, influential all-sky survey in the optical. And for brown dwarf signs, what it provides is that if you see something in, in two mass, nothing in, two, in SDSS, then it's probably a, a brown dwarf. Now, thanks to all these surveys and uh, some other, uh, uh, some few more, we actually know today more than 2,000 brown dwarfs. Now, with more than 2,000 brown dwarfs known, let's talk about what we know in general about brown dwarfs today. So first thing, it turns out that our first two discoveries are uh, actually pretty special because they belong to totally different classes of brown dwarfs. Tidal one, the hot and young brown dwarfs, uh, belong to this class called the L dwarf. Don't care about the name too much. While the Gliese 229b, the coal and old brown dwarf, belong to another uh, different class called a T dwarf. And uh, naturally, you would expect a progression from a uh, hot object cooling down, cooling down slowly to uh, old object and cold object to be quite smooth. But turns out that this jump between two classes is actually pretty abrupt. And the reason is because for this hot and young brown dwarf, what you get is that uh, uh, magnesium and silicate start to condense out of the atmosphere and form clouds. So you get clouds just like clouds on Earth, but they're made of uh, these uh, metals including iron metal liquid. So you literally have clouds made out of molten iron on the atmosphere. And this is what happens when you have atmosphere at this kind of temperatures. So it turns out that uh, our dwarf atmospheres are all covered by these crazy clouds, producing one type of spectrum. And at this jump around 1,000 Kelvin, what happens is that all these clouds sink down to the low level where we can't see them anymore and uh, methane becomes the prominent gas in the atmosphere. That's when the spectrum of these objects turn in from a starlight uh, spectrum into something like that of Gliese 229b, which has a lot of uh, crazy absorption features. And this uh, so-called the LT transition is still an active area of research today, because people are still trying to come up with models that can explain this 
um, uh, this explain this observation. Another thing we know is that uh, because the transition, because this transition between two types of round dwarf is so abrupt, you would expect a very very dynamic and very very feature full atmosphere. And these two images are um, results from very very recent research. One is the surface map of a nearby brown dwarf system called Lumen 16b. And um, what, what the astronomers did here is that they take spectrum of the brown dwarf and wait for it to rotate around. And using this data, you can reconstruct what uh, the hot and cold spots on the surface look like. And as you can see from the map here, that this, this uh, atmosphere is, is, is anything but homogeneous. You see a lot of bright and dark patches rotating around as the brown dwarf rotate, rotates. Another result from more recently from 2016 show that uh, the, the brightness as a function of time from this one older brown, uh, brown dwarf can be explained really well by having bands and spots of clouds rotating in and out of view. And this is quite similar to what we see on, on gas giant planets on, in, our so, in our own solar system. So this shows that um, atmospheres on brown dwarf is anything but boring. Another thing you might want to do is that if you can have objects that are 1,000 kelvins down to around 900, few hundred kelvin, can we go down, can we go colder and find colder objects? And the answer is, of course, we can. Now, the problem is that once, uh, once you get to these very, very cold uh, objects, remember that 500 Kelvin is just around like a boiling point of water. It's, it's, it's not very high at all. Well, a bit higher than that. But so what, what you need is that uh, the survey we had before that we conduct from the ground um, can only go so far in wavelength before it gets cut off by uh, background from the atmosphere. So what you need is that you need to send a probe up to, up to space and put in a camera that can go to even, even, uh, even longer wavelengths. So this is what NASA did with this telescope called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE. Among other things, it uh, performed all-sky survey again in, ver uh, in a number of different infrared bands, which is, since sent, uh, which is even more sensitive to cold stuff than uh, uh, what we have been doing at the turn of the century. And one of the discovery that, that uh, has been made is this object called WISE 1828. And it turns out to be one of the uh, nearby brown dwarf. But it has a temperature of 500 Kelvin, which is by far the coldest brown dwarf we have ever seen. And one cool thing about uh, WISE 1828 is that, remember that Gliese 229b has um, Absorption features from methane. Why is 1828 is cold enough to have not just methane but also have uh, ammonia, which makes it even uh, uh, closer to the atmosphere of things like Jupiter. So, I start by saying that uh, uh, stars and brown dwarfs are totally different types of object, right? But now, as we are progressing to the lower and lower mass regime. We have to start asking ourselves, now what's the difference actually between brown dwarfs and planets? Because you can have things at the same temperature, you can have things at the same mass, and even more, thanks to the, the fact that these things are propped up by the quantum mechanic uh, pressure that I talked about earlier, it turns out that brown dwarfs are almost all at the same size, and they're all pretty much the, same, the size of the Jupiter. So if you were to fly to one, it will look quite similar to Jupiter, actually, with temperature that are not that widely off from the temperature of Jupiter. So this kind of begs the question, what really is the physical difference between uh, brown dwarfs and planets? And to deepen this, uh, this question further, there are planetary systems that we find around other stars. And these things have mass, definitely, uh, in the planetary regime. But if, I mean, if, if you compare images, they, they look re really similar in, in, in many ways. So I, uh, I, would, I, I want to say that um, when, um, 
unlike the transition from stars to, to, to brown dwarfs, the transition from brown dwarfs to planets is a much more fuzzy line, and we, we are still pretty much arguing if, if the line exists at all. So um, in conclusion, brown dwarfs are things that are less massive than stars and cannot have nuclear fusion in the core. And the cutoff is at 8% mass of the sun. The first discovery after the prediction was made in uh, 1995 by either looking uh, for really red, really cold objects in clusters nearby or looking around nearby stars. And today, thanks to all the all-sky surveys that we have, more than 2,000 of them are known. And now the quest is on to find even cold, uh, colder, less massive objects and to try to understand this uh, even bottom lower part of the mass distribution of objects on the sky. There are some work done here at, uh, at Caltech by my group, and I'll be more than happy to talk about it more after this. But for now, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. So, uh, let's see. So one, one key thing that brown rocks can provide is that we, we want to know about atmospheres around planets in other solar systems apart from our own. The problem is that it's difficult to take images like this. It's, this is actually like one of the very few systems that we can ever image, ever. So what brown rock provide is that they have quite similar atmosphere to, to these things. So instead of trying very hard to study uh, these exoplanet systems, we can learn some clues from look, uh, by looking at brown rocks. So I came from the other side because I studied exoplanets. So I know the threshold oh. <laughs> for exoplanets. Would you consider that the threshold is still about 13 mass of Jupiter? Yes. So 13, so 13 mass of the Jupiter is set by the fact that brown dwarfs can actually burn some deuterium, which is a different isotope of hydrogen, uh, early on in the life. But the, the deuterium burning actually doesn't affect the evolution all that much. So some, some, people, some people consider that as a, uh, as a cutoff between planets and brown dwarfs, but some people argue that you know, uh, after a few million years, it, it, they're, they're identical. Yes, yes. Um, I think it, it would be more like we will meet in the middle because, you know, uh, most techniques that detect planets now, uh, uh, that we have today will, can, can detect planets from like very, very small mass and going up. And then techniques like direct imaging will detect one of the most massive planets and, and starting to push down. So I feel like we will at some point get, uh, get you know, somewhere in the middle and find everything in the whole spectrum. Um, so not for brown dwarfs. Brown, so brown, brown dwarfs that are isolated in the field don't have, you know, don't typically have a parent star. So the radiation you get is actually coming from the initial collapse, because you have to convert the gravitational energy of the initial huge cloud into something that is compact. So it turns out that most of it turns into heat. And so that's, that's why brown dwarfs are born really hot and then cools down. So that's the, where, where the radiation comes from. What elements are in the, the that composed like the larger stars like our sun? 
Can, can you repeat that again? Well, Sorry. Right, right, yes, sorry. So um, for the sun, because the surface is so hot, uh, all this trace element, like if you, you can have some iron, you can have like anything from the periodic, periodic table really, but they are not doing much in terms of uh, uh, the observation. They, they, they don't affect the observation as much. Yeah. So the main, the main elements would be just hydrogen and helium. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, it's unlikely, and the reason is because if if you have to shed that much mass out, then that mass must go somewhere, and we we should be able to see it today. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good question, though. All right, audience, vast audience, of which hopefully there will be more people who come in. Um, oh, it just got smaller. Okay. Well, well, oh, okay, it got even smaller. So, well, I'm, you are our audience. Uh, our speakers are our expert panel tonight. Max Miller Blancher, postdoc at JPL, uh, does similar research to uh, what was being talked about tonight with Gao. Um, is happy to answer questions on exoplanets, adaptive optics, and planet formation. Cameron Hummels, that's me. Uh, I'm a postdoc here uh, doing computational studies of galaxies, and I can talk about simulations, the space program, galaxies, what have you. Dylan Dong, graduate student. Uh, happy to talk about galaxies, radio astronomy, and gamma ray bursts. And then Lee Rosenthal, graduate student here, happy to talk about solar system, telescope, and supernovae. So, do you guys have anything on your mind that you want to talk about, or should we just ramble about space news? Yes, you have a question. Yes, neutron stars were in the news. You, you, about like the merging binary neutron star? Or neutron stars in general? Oh. Oh, well, we can. Who want, do you want to talk about neutron stars? Your supernovae. But you can talk about neutron stars. Here. So that's a great question. So I think uh, what you're alluding to is what, the, what this was a month ago? Like, like about a month ago, um, there was an announcement from LIGO, which is the laser. Interferometer, gravi gravi yes, uh, gravitational wave observatory, um, that they had detected a merger between uh, two neutron stars uh, in, in our galaxy. And so what this actually means uh, when they say they detected it is that LIGO is uh, a set of two and, and three with, with, a partner, uh, with a partnership with this other observatory. Basically, gi giant L's. S sitting like sitting on the ground, and these these like big L's. Uh, what's it like a kilometer? Yeah. No, no, there are four kilometers. The arms are like four four, four kilometers, two and a half miles. Two and a half miles thank you. Uh, long. Are ba it's basically a system of. Oh, thank. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And then there's one in Germany. There's one in Italy. Italy. This is a 100% accurate map. Yes, um, very accurate to see all their eyes. They're opening one in Japan up here, and they're opening one in India. So, so I can get it. I can. Yeah. It, 
I'll t uh, in a bit, I'll get to why it's exciting that they're opening more of these things. But basically, each one of those X's represents uh, like a two and a half mile long L that is basically a, a that the actual arms of the L are vacuum tubes with uh, lasers and mirrors in them. And so there's basically a perfect sort of timing system for the, the time it takes for a laser to like cross the L and back across the mirror system. And what these uh, Ls are looking for, the reason that you have this mirror, it's a very sensitive mirror setup, so it's like sensitive to, earth, like, to earthquakes, to other forms of noise, like it will, it will be able to tell when something is an actual signal from space versus um, something that, that comes from the Earth. And what they're looking for um, are gravitational waves. And so gravitational waves are a phenomenon that come out of Einstein's theory of gravity. So Einstein's theory of gravity says, can you do like the drawing of the, tram like the trampoline drawing maybe? Uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> um, so Einstein's theory of gravity says that gravity comes, that spa space and time are actually this one big mesh. Like, you can think of stuff sitting in, in four, everything having like four coordinates. Like it's got a coordinate this forward and backwards, left and right, up and down, and then it's got a coordinate in time. And what Einstein figured out was that um, if, you, if you put mass, like a, ma a, a massive object, in this mesh, the mesh will bend. So like the space and time warp around matter, and that causes, that, that cause, that co that is what gravity is. When something is, when we are like falling towards the Earth, that's actually us following these curved paths in the mesh. Good, good so far. Yeah, no, I know. I'm sorry. I'm doing. I, I guess I went too basic. The the reason that the neutron stars are are, are exciting is gravitational waves come are um, come. Come, come out of like collisions in, in general relativity. Like if you have two massive objects, like two neutron stars that collide, or that orbit each other and then merge, that, that's sort of like people jumping up and down on, on this like mesh represented as a trampoline and that creates waves in space and time. And so these two neutron stars that merge, we think of them, like each one of them is the remnant of, of an older, of like what, what used to be a star was probably a little more massive than, than the sun. Than, than the sun. Um, and, and they each became a neutron star after burning all their fuel. Um, and these two stars were initially orbiting each other, and you're left with two neutron stars orbiting each other. So that's a great question. So, so they, um, do, so there, there are two answers to that. When, when you have these objects that were initially stars and then transitioned into neutron, into each transitioned into a neutron star, I, I might get this part wrong, but I, I think what, what happens in that case usually is you have a, a core collapse supernova. So these, when, when really massive stars or sufficiently massive stars run out of hydrogen, the, the way that Gao described, they run out of hydrogen that they're burning to support themselves. They collapse, there's a big explosion, and then you're left over with the dense degenerate core. So, wh which I think Gao also talked about that, degenerate, degeneracy pressure, except instead of electrons repelling each other, the, the leftover core is so dense that e even electrons and protons, like, Gra gravity, is too, gravity is so strong that the electrons and protons can't repel each other. So they, they uh, basically merge and form neutrons. Um, and so you're left with this like, hyper, hyper dense, what, what is it like if you had a teaspoon of neutron star matter? It, what? Yeah, that's a good it, it's, it's, the, Yeah, it's a good point. It's, it's sort of a terminology that comes from the fact that they're the remnant of a star. And so you had these two objects that were orbiting each other because stars often form, the, the, the way that the physics of star formation for, for works out, it's particularly common for them to form in pairs that orbit each other. Um, so you have these two leftover cores and they're orbiting each other, but their orbit starts to decay because when you have two very massive objects orbiting each other, like that, they actually radiate away energy as gravitational waves, which are these sort of bends in space and time that LIGO was built to look for. And when, as they get closer, as they keep radiating energy away, they get closer together and they start orbiting faster, so it's like.
So they, they get closer together and speed up, and the waves become more intense until eventually they crash into each other and they merge. There's a, an explosion that's sometimes known as a, as a gamma ray burst. Dylan can, can talk about that. But um, uh, more, impo like, more importantly for LIGO, the, a black hole is left over. And the gravitational wave pattern that build, builds up to that kind of looks like, like that. Like it's, it's sort of faster and faster and stronger and stronger until it just goes away. And the reason that um, there was so much excitement a month ago when this detection happened um, is that we had never seen gravitational waves from two neutron stars before. So far, ev until then, every detection had been from two black holes merging. And since they were neutron stars, they also like gave off light. They gave off optical light when they merged before they became one black hole. And since they gave off light, unlike these black holes that we had observed only with LIGO, you could also actually observe them with telescopes. So you could follow up um, and actually like take, take spectra like, th like th the way that Gal described or, or measure their brightness over time, stuff like that. So d does that answer your, your question? Yeah. Great question. Uh, and the answer to that is we have never seen anything like this before. Uh, it's incredibly bright um, in the optical. And what's really weird is that the gamma rays are correspondingly incredibly weak. So we used to think that this class of uh, explosions known as short gamma ray bursts, so these are gamma, intense bursts of gamma rays that last for maybe like two seconds or less. We, we used to think that these were neutron star, neutron star mergers. However, um, it appears that this is no longer the case. And like the, the one confirmed neutron star, neutron star merger that we saw looked nothing like these short gamma ray bursts. Incredibly wimpy gamma rays, incredibly bright optical signal. Uh, you get a, a very uh, fast, like couple hours blue flash, and then you get you know, uh, a very long lived uh, red fade out to this explosion. And uh, we really just don't know any other explosion like this. Um, and so there's a recent paper that came out last week uh, that uh, pretty much conclusively rules out uh, a short gamma ray burst as being uh, the cause of the explosion that we actually saw. And now we're back to the drawing board. We don't really know what short gamma ray bursts are anymore. <laughs> but hopefully LIGO will find more of these events and we'll be able to uh, understand neutron star and neutron star mergers better. Yeah, these are really rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we only knew because LIGO uh, sent out a trigger to uh, all the optical and infrared and radio observers and gamma ray observers and x-ray observers of the world. You know, they're high priority alert. You know, everybody's cell phone is ringing off the hook. Nobody slept. Right? Uh, you know, people were going all around the world. If you saw Monsi's talk two months ago, you heard all about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh yeah, so the question was, um, when you have a gamma ray burst, does it go in all directions, like a sphere? Or is it beamed, like two, two pencil beams coming out of uh, the thing that exploded? And the answer is the two beams. Um, it's very difficult. Gamma ray bursts are just incredibly bright. They're like, during the short time that they're going off, I think they like outshine the universe or something like that. Uh, and so it's very difficult to explain uh, without invoking this beaming. Because what happens when you beam is that you get this uh, sort of magnification due to relativity. Uh, and that's one way that you can get things to be brighter. And also what happens when you beam is that all of your energy of your explosion gets concentrated into one direction. So uh, instead of just having it spread out in all directions, uh, you can you know, explain an extremely high observed uh, like flux, uh, a whole ton of light, um, by the fact that all that explosion energy was just in your direction. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, how do we know that? 
Yeah. So Cameron just said that it's like the difference between a flashlight and a light bulb. So how do we know that this flashlight wasn't pointing at us and then it was coming from us? So uh, the, the question was how do we know that this flashlight wasn't pointing at us? Are you talking about the double neutron star merger? Uh, yeah. So um, we know that it wasn't pointing at us because uh, we saw an incredibly bright optical flash and an incredibly weak gamma ray signal. And what happens when you have something that's pointing at you is that you get very strong gamma rays uh, relative to the optical. Um, and you just cannot explain the, the weak gamma rays and the strong optical with this uh, uh, directly like, pointing at you beam. Now, for a long time, or uh, long time, for, for the last few months, there have been a lot of papers that have said that uh, this was actually an off-axis gamma ray burst. So, Let's say that uh, this is the Earth here, um, and here's the explosion. People thought maybe, oh, the beams are like that, right? And we're just not seeing it head on. But uh, the paper that I was talking about that came out last week uh, shows that the late time radio signal from this is inconsistent with this model. And I can give you more details about that later if you're interested. Questions about anything? It doesn't have to be about gamma ray bursts or neutron stars. Or... Yeah. I don't okay, sure. So, uh, you talked about the previous question about uh, you know, something which is so massive that the gravitational force overcomes the repulsion, electrical and magnetic repulsion, and you know, uh, collapses. If it's even more massive, it becomes a black hole, right? It's not neutron stars. Is that how we think about it? Yes. So uh, the question was relating back to one of the previous uh, responses that, for neutron stars. Um, neutron stars are so dense and, when, and massive enough that their gravitational forces attract everything close together and that gravitational force can overcome the repulsion between protons and electrons that are normally you know, repelled because of electromagnetic forces. So it can it can force those to be close together and merge into neutrons and thus you get a neutron star which for all intents and purposes is just a big nucleus. It's just a, a star structure that's on the order of the mass of our sun but it's just made of neutrons for the most part which is pretty crazy. It's like this you know, sun-sized nucleus of an atom um, and that's why it's so dense where you know, like a teaspoon weighs the amount of Manhattan, the mass of Manhattan. Um, but if you go even more massive, yes, then not only do you overcome the electromagnetic repulsion, but you actually allow it to overcome the, uh, what is it, the poly exclusion principle, the, yeah. so it's essentially actually, the repulsion. I think nobody actually understands what holds up neutron stars in detail. Right. Um, White dwarfs are uh, known to be this uh, electron degeneracy pressure, the same thing that holds up brown dwarfs. Um, and the white dwarfs are also uh, incredibly dense, compact objects. Neutron stars are even more dense. So white dwarfs are like, you know, maybe the mass of the sun, but the size of the Earth. Whereas a neutron star is like mass of the sun, the size of Manhattan. Uh, and you know, white dwarfs we, we understand somewhat, uh, and we think that it's this uh, electron degeneracy pressure that holds up brown dwarfs, same thing. But uh, neutron stars, there's, you know, nobody really understands what's actually in the center. And there's this huge debate over, uh, you'll hear words like, what's the equation of state of uh, degenerate neutron matter? And really that's, what's say, that's just saying, you know, there's some sort of weird physics that's going on in the center of neutron stars. And uh, it's definitely an open question to try and study this. Yeah, Chandrasekhar limits for white dwarfs. Yes. So we mm -hmm. don't have that for yeah. Mm -hmm. So for for sense of scale, um, the Chandrasekhar limit is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Uh, the most massive neutron star that's ever been observed was two times the mass of the sun. But uh, theoretically, it can go up to three, but we've never seen anything that was that massive. So maybe, you know, maybe we just haven't seen it, or maybe it can't exist. Can it be smaller than it? Uh -huh. Can it be smaller than it? 
uh, the, the question is, can it be a very small mass? Um, I don't know what's the least massive. I imagine that it's like maybe half a solar mass or something like that. Uh, for, I don't know, least massive neutron star? Does anybody know? Uh, yeah. Um, just just for, for, for anyone who might, who might not, not know this term, the Chandrasekhar mass is the, the maximum, the, the mass of this guy named Chandrasekhar derived, where it's uh, the largest, that, uh, the most massive that a white dwarf can be, um, where uh, uh, until, basically it's the point where the, the forces that, uh, of electron degeneracy that hold it up uh, are equal to the force of gravity that's pulling it in. And if it's any more massive than that, then gravity, um, yeah, then, then gravity becomes, yeah, it, basically any, any less massive than that and the star is stable because if it, if it were to shrink a little bit, then electron degeneracy pressure would increase and so it would puff back out a little. And then when it puffs back out a little, gravity pulls back in. But if it's more massive than this limit, then as gravity pulls in, electron degeneracy just can't keep up, basically. And it just runs away and collapses. And there's a really cool story associated with it. So Chandrasekhar was this Indian astrophysicist from the early part of the, well, started in the early part of the 20th century. And it was recognized that this guy was a complete genius. Uh, and so he was. He was on a boat, I believe, from India to, to the UK to meet with some of the most preeminent astronomers of the time who were living in the UK. So he's on, this is like, you know, right after World War I. So it's a long boat ride. And he's just doing pencil and paper calculations about, about how white dwarfs support themselves that no one had ever done before. And now you normally need computers to do this sort of thing. But he had a lot of time because he was on this boat for months. So he's doing all of these calculations and he comes up with this. And it's a big deal because this is, this is linking very different areas of physics. It's linking quantum mechanics, which we think of as operating on microscopic scales, with general relativity that had only been around for 10 years at that point, which is generally dealing with the largest things. It's gravity, so it's like how stars and planets and things interact. And he's, he's putting these together and, and allowing this balance to come up to make a very firm uh, prediction for the maximum mass that a white dwarf can be. And he later won the Nobel Prize in physics for, for this discovery, and I think it was recognized in the 60s or something. But he's one of the most preeminent you know, astrophysicists in, the, in our history. And, he did these calculations while he was like on a boat with a pencil. It's really amazing. Anyway, I'm not doing it justice. The question is, if a gamma ray burst occurs and no one observes it, does it actually produce an electromagnetic field, which is the equivalent of you know, if a tree falls down in the woods and no one hears it fall, does it, isn't that how it goes? I'm not good at jokes. So, yes. <laughs> uh, it, it's not observed, so I guess not. Uh, by, by definition, you're, sorry. If, if, if something is a gamma ray burst, then by definition it's produced electromagnetic radiation in the form of gamma rays. But, but yes, I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, do you want to talk about heliosseismology? <laughs> okay, so uh, the question was, does our sun uh, fluctuate in size? And the answer is not much but there are sort of ripples that go on in the sun, and actually the sun being the star that is closest to us, uh, we have like exquisite data. There are satellites monitoring like all around the sun just continuously. You can watch like live streams and stuff. Uh, so y you sometimes see like little uh, sort of pulsations, but incredibly tiny ones, and uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you much more about them. Oh, you can. But I can. Yes. Um, so the study is called uh, 
helioseismology, seismology like when you think of a seismograph. Uh, so you're essentially studying the, their, their sun quakes, essentially, their, their pressure waves and gravity waves, not gravitational waves, but pressure waves uh, and, and gravity waves, wh which are essentially just buoyant waves within this big gaseous plasma ball. And so you'll have waves that will ripple all the way through the interior. That's actually how we know what we know about the interior of the sun, because nobody's, nobody's gone inside the sun, right? It's way too hot. And we can't see inside the sun with our telescopes because, well, we can only see as deep as the surface or maybe the top kilometer of the sun. Um, so what we know about the interior is essentially the waves that we see rippling out of the surface, uh, they propagate through these media within the sun at different speeds and we can figure out something about the density structure inside. It's the same thing with the earth. No one's been to the center of the earth unless you believe the movie The Core, which is a really bad science fiction film, but I recommend it nonetheless. It's fun to watch. <laughs> Um, but we know about some of the, the different structures deep down, you know, the mantle and the core of the, of the earth simply because we know the, the rate at which waves pass through the interior of our, of our earth and that we measure with seismographs and, and that sort of thing. So there's, there's a lot that can go into it. We can actually study this around other stars um, by, by monitoring kind of the waves that are coming off. And when I say waves, I mean acoustic waves, like sound waves that, and, and how it ripples. We can, we can follow this for nearby stars and, and figure out their, their density structures and such. But um, it's a really active field of, of research and it's pretty interesting. Uh, the, the, the gentleman in front and then we'll get to the gentleman in back. Who wants to answer this? Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the evolutionary track is, ah. So the, the question was um, kind of generally about the evolution of stars uh, versus evolution of planets and when they pass through these different stages and, and where planets and brown dwarfs fit into that. Um, so. Uh, generally, uh, going back to, to what Gao was saying in his talk, um, stars form in this big cloud of, of hydrogen gas with a small mixture of, of dust and other gases in there as well. And so this, this cloud ends up collapsing uh, into a star, and, and it might be a star like ours, it might be a, a little bit smaller. As Gao mentioned, if the, the mass of that cloud isn't big enough, uh, you end up forming a brown dwarf. Um, if the mass of that cloud is, is a lot larger, you end up forming a much larger star. Um, and the way that these larger stars evolve um, is they go, go through different stages of, of what they're burning at their core. Uh, so they start off just bur burning hydrogen and then they move on to helium and, and heavier and heavier elements. Uh, and if they're massive enough, then, then we get uh, a supernova. Um, and if, uh, if they're really massive, um, they then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, because you know this part better. Uh, if, they're, if they're really massive, when you have the supernova, they collapse into a, a black hole. Uh, if they're not quite as massive, uh, they'll collapse into a neutron star. And then if they're a little bit less massive, you'll end up with a white dwarf. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's true. And then so um, uh, on the other side, if it's much smaller, uh, you, you'll get a brown dwarf. And, and these brown dwarfs um, really range. So we found free-floating objects um, that are either uh, exoplanets that formed in a solar system and got ejected, or they might be like brown dwarfs that were formed um, from just a much, much smaller cloud of gas that condensed down. Um, 
planets form differently than all of those other objects. Um, where when you have this star and it's collapsing, if there's e even a, a little bit of rotation in, in that big gas cloud uh, as it starts to collapse, as it collapses more and more, that rotation becomes uh, much flatter uh, and much faster. And, and in the same way that um, uh, we, we usually reference uh, ice s figure skaters here where when they have their arms out and then pull them in, they start going much faster. And so that's exactly what happens in this giant molecular, or, or this giant hydrogen cloud as is it, is it collapses, it starts spinning faster. And then uh, in the end, what you end up with is a, a disk of gas and dust uh, that's orbiting this forming star. And it's uh, within this disk uh, that planets start forming, both Earth-like and, and more Jupiter-like planets. Uh, just to add on to that a little bit more. Um, so uh, we alluded to how uh, the mass is just incredibly important in determining the fate of a star. Uh, and to just give some numbers to this, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Gao, uh, I think uh, things that are uh, less than 0 0.08 times the mass of a sun end up being brown dwarfs or so. Uh, things that are anywhere between 0 0.08 to uh, maybe seven or eight times the mass of the sun end up being white dwarfs after they burn out and they just uh, shed off their atmosphere and they cool down. Uh, and then things that are between eight and, I don't know, like 20 times the mass of the sun or something explode in supernovae and become neutron stars. And things that are much more massive than that uh, explode also in supernovae and uh, become directly into black holes. <laughs> the gentleman in the back. So the question is, in the uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, as you're closer to more and more massive objects, uh, time progresses slower for you relative to uh, if you aren't close to that massive object. So if you're next to a black hole, is time completely stopped for you? Um, is, that the, is that roughly the question? Okay, so if you're, if you're next to the singularity, which is basically the, the central part of, of the black hole, um, can anything actually change there, or is time so slowed down for you uh, that, that nothing can ever really change? Um, so I'm going to take the cheater's way out of this question and say, uh, we don't know what, like physics cannot speak about what's going on within the event horizon of a black hole, simply because the way we know about things in the universe is that we get information about those things from either going there and collecting it, like in geology, we can pick up a rock and that can tell us something, or about distant objects in the universe by the light or gravitational waves that come to us but within the event horizon of a black hole, and the event horizon is defined by the, the sphere surrounding the singularity uh, where, where it's essentially where it's black, where light, the speed of light is not fast enough to beat the escape velocity from that particular object. Um, so within the event horizon, nothing, once you go past the event horizon, you're stuck. You're going all the way to the center of the singularity and nothing can get out, not even light. Uh, so within the event horizon, we don't have any information because light, light can't escape, so therefore no information can escape. So it's really, in a way, cut off from the rest of the universe in the same way that 
you know, beyond our light cone in the universe, you know, farther away than, than 14 billion light years away from us, light hasn't had long enough to transfer us. So beyond the, the edge of our universe, we can't, we can't speak to because we don't have information about it, but we also don't have information about what's going on inside the event horizon. So we, it's really, physics can't really talk about it anymore. Science can't really talk about it anymore. Except Lee. Lee can talk about it. <laughs> no, Lee can't talk about it. But just, just something, something else that's cool about this is you mentioned that like, there's this, this boundary called the event horizon, which Cameron said is this sphere around uh, the, the center of a black hole. And this also comes out of general relativity, where like, if you write out Einstein's equations for, a, for like, a spherical mass that's sufficiently large, you get this point. But like, to describe it as a boundary, it is it is like kind of kind of weird because it, say you were like an astronaut out in space close to but like not actually very close to a black hole so you were observing like a second astronaut that was going towards the black hole you would never actually see them go through the event horizon because of the way that gravity works and slows time down you would just see them like start to creep closer and closer more and more slowly to the event horizon but not actually cross it. So it's like not just a boundary in terms of like you see someone go past it and then they're gone. It's like a boundary in terms of any any information that that can 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 get out. Yeah. But it's an interesting idea that you pose that you know, we on earth experiencing experience time slightly more slowly than if we were in deep space. And if if the earth were a thousand times more massive, it would slower still uh, for us to and my microphone is cutting out I'm gonna get another microphone but um, but but we don't experience time differently in comparison it's slower but you know a second is a second to us right right so if if we to, to take uh, you know, ignoring this event horizon argument that I already made and kind of as, as my cop-out response um, I think time would continue for the person next to the black hole or, or to the objects near the black hole singularity, time would continue to, to move forward from that, that reference frame, but it would just be, uh, it would just take that much longer for things outside. Yeah, you you got it. You got it exactly right. So so that's the, the re so remember like it's Einstein's theory of gravity is called general relativity. That second word is important, right? Every, like every, everything in gravity, uh, everything in general relativity arises because of the relative um, motions or in relative locations of two different observers. Um, so basically, that means that your your experience like. The, the physics that two, that two observers experience is different depending on like how close they are to a mass or how fast they're moving with respect to each other or whether they're accelerating, which means like picking up in speed. So in the case of those two astronauts, um, if astronaut A is kind of far away from, from the black hole and watching astronaut B go increasingly closer to the black hole and then cro cross the event horizon, he's never actually, astronaut A is never gonna see astronaut B cross the event horizon, but astronaut B, like, like you said, like, time will still just be going forward for him, so he doesn't see this black wall coming up to him and then nothingness. Like, for him, he's just experiencing time, except he's getting more and more uncomfortable because he's going to be stretched like spaghetti, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but he's, time for him is, is going to be going normally, but if he looks at astronaut A, He's going to see time for astronaut A to speed up, right? Like, B, sorry, B is B is Billy going into the into the B is Billy going into the black hole. A is Alice hanging out outside the black hole, watching her friend Billy disappear forever. Um, but uh, and so 
So B is just going to, time is just moving normally for B from, from her perspective, but she, but, sorry, no, B is Billy. <laughs> not important. Not important. B, yeah. Um, A will see Billy just hang out here and never cross because time will, will basically become so slow for Billy. Astronaut Alice. Move out of the way so they can see too. Astronaut Alice, who's out here away from the event horizon of our black hole, and astronaut Billy, who's going, mistakenly, going close to the black hole. Uh, astronaut Alice sees Billy approach, and then even though Billy actually passes the event horizon, astronaut Alice just sees Billy staying at the, at the event horizon indefinitely and never actually enters. And that's the Alice, it's not just that Alice doesn't see Billy cross that line, it's that from Alice's frame of reference, like sitting where Alice is sitting, Billy, Billy never actually crosses that line. Whereas from Billy's sitting, from where, from where Billy is sitting in his short-lived glorious journey uh, into the black hole, he's, he's crossing that line, but time, if he looks at Alice, time is gonna be weird and he'll see Alice grow old and increasing it, it, it just time time gets wonky but like what happens is literally different depending on where you're sitting in this situation uh, <laughs> yeah but also you you had a follow up The question is, do black holes have to instantly come into existence? Because if they slowly built up, then their mass and the slowed space-time around them wouldn't allow them to continue to evolve. Is that, yeah. Um, black holes, black holes are confusing. There are a lot of black holes. In fact, there was a big black hole that was in the news yesterday or two days ago. Did you guys read about this? The, the highest, the highest redshift, which essentially means the most distant, uh, massive, supermassive black hole was just discovered in the universe. It's about 200 million times the mass of the sun. It's, it's called a quasar or a, an AGN, which stands for active galactic nucleus. And it's, it's, uh, there was evidence from an astronomer at the Carnegie Observatories just on the other side of Pasadena. Yeah, Carnegie. Yeah. Um, they discovered this massive black hole. So that's a massive black hole, and that actually poses its own problem. How can you form this supermassive black hole, 200 million times the mass of the sun, very, very shortly after the birth of the universe? We just don't know how you can form such a massive black hole on such a short time scale. But that's, it, it doesn't pop, as we understand it, it, doesn't, it is a problem how to form it, but it doesn't pop into, instantaneously into existence. Um, Stellar mass, like the mass of our sun mass black holes, typically form through what we've been talking about, through core collapse supernovae, which is to say you have a big massive star, like a 50 solar mass star, 40 solar mass star, and over, over its evolution, um, it burns out all of its fuel in the center, burns out all of its hydrogen and such, and it collapses and, and uh, turns into a supernova, and then what's left over there is a black hole. So I guess in a way, it pops into existence through the supernova event, but, um, but you can certainly increase the mass of black holes over time. Let's say we have a, a one solar mass black hole, which is to say uh, a, uh, a black hole that has the same mass as our sun, you can build that up to be a two solar mass black hole or a three solar mass black hole by just throwing stuff onto it. And even though time, as we see it, time seems to stop at the event horizon, material is flowing into it and it is accreting matter and getting more massive. And I know that sounds confusing and now I'm confused as well. <laughs> So just to add on to what Cameron was saying, uh, 
I, I know that you're not supposed to write formulas for public talks, but I feel like it's important in this case. Uh, basically, uh, at least what, what I was sort of reading into your question was, uh, does it have to, does a black hole have to pop into existence in, in, instantaneously? And if it doesn't, you know, is there ever like that singularity exposed, right? Is there ever like a brief amount of time where the laws of physics break somewhere in the universe? And uh, I don't know the answer, but uh, here's my attempt at explaining it. Well, um, you know, the, the black hole starts with something really small, right? Uh, in this formula here, uh, R is the radius of the black hole. So the black hole is a sphere. Um, and it's equal to some number, 2, some number G, and some number uh, 1 over C squared. These are just numbers. Ignore these. Uh, times the mass of the black hole. So. If a black hole ever has radius zero, then it also has mass zero, and it's just nothing, right? But if you dump some mass and you say that it's a black hole, then it's just going to have some uh, event horizon of size r, and that, it, that singularity will never be exposed. So the laws of physics are safe for now. <laughs> They exist, yeah. We've uh, there's uh, we've directly seen them from LIGO by uh, by detecting merging black holes, right? Black holes colliding into each other. Um, we know that uh, there's something incredibly dense in the center of our galaxy that is like uh, a couple million times the mass of the sun uh, in a very very small space, uh, and we can actually track the orbits of stars going around this thing. Uh, and it's, it's very black. We don't see anything there. <laughs> and it's so dense that it has to be a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a question. Mm -hmm. um, is the center of a black hole theoretical, though? Because like, how conceptually could you have a point of infinity? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is the center of a black hole theoretical? And yes, uh, it's, it's where the equations of general relativity break down. Um, Einstein's theory just uh, blows up into infinities everywhere, and infinities don't actually exist in the universe. So basically, it's saying that we cannot explain the center of a black hole. But luckily, we don't have to, because uh, that center of the black hole, as Cameron was saying, will never affect anything outside of the event horizon of the black hole. And so nothing in the universe has ever changed. It could be you know, uh, a fluffy bunny rabbit in the center of a black hole, and we would never know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Hmm? No, and in fact, uh, it's thought that instruments like the Large Hadron Collider, the particle collider that's been going in on the border between Switzerland and France, um, it has such high energy interactions. It's possible that it's actively creating like microscopic black holes, but there's a process called Hawking radiation, which was uh, theorized by Stephen Hawking, the famous English uh, astrophysicist, where, where you're able to essentially evaporate uh, away. They, uh, all black holes give off some form of radiation in the form of like uh, subatomic particles. And, and the, this rate, it essentially means that very small black holes will immediately evaporate through Hawking radiation. So we're not in danger of creating these black holes that are going to swallow the Earth because they'll immediately evaporate. Whereas like a... a hotter, that what's that? Smaller black holes are hotter, get colder, get larger. It radiates a lot more relative to its mass when it's very small than when it's very large. Yeah, the evaporation time scale for like a, a solar mass black hole is a hundred times the age of the universe or some ridiculous number. So it's not going to evaporate anytime soon, whereas the evaporation time scale for an for a atom-sized black hole is like five microseconds or something. So it just happens instantaneously. So, so the only way a black hole can go away is to evaporate. There's no other mechanism. There's no other mechanism that we have for getting rid of a black hole. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Yu Guang is our telescope captain for the night, and he's making an announcement. Yeah, 
So if anybody wants an opportunity to look at the Orion Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy and the Pleiades. Oh, they don't have the Pleiades anymore. Okay, Andromeda and Orion. If you want to check them out, now's your chance. Last chance in 2017. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have better weather in 2018. Yes, question. Can we talk about interstellar? Like, about the physics that was going into it? Sure. Uh, so, I guess a raise of hands for people who've seen interstellar. Perhaps a raise of hands of people who haven't seen interstellar. I don't want to spoil it. This is, no, that was Contact, was the Jodie Foster. Uh, inter, interstellar came out uh, a, two years ago. It was directed by Christopher Nolan. It starred a bunch of people. Matthew McConaughey, what? Matt Damon, yeah, that's right. Uh, who's the old guy who's in every Christopher Nolan? Michael Caine. Just, wow, you, you know your business. <laughs> Jessica Chastain. Um, what's interesting is it was, the original screenplay was written by Kip Thorne, who's a professor in this building. Um, he was also the guy who won the Nobel Prize in Physics this year for his contributions, because he's basically the father of the LIGO project. And he also writes screenplays for <laughs> popular Hollywood films. Yeah. Uh, it was modified to some degree by Christopher Nolan, but there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a deal struck between Kip Thorne and Christopher Nolan, wherein uh, Christopher Nolan promised or Kip Thorne demanded that if he was going to be made into a film, there couldn't be anything that was totally unphysical that could be included in the film. Everything had to be physically possible. Not necessarily physically probable, but there could not be anything that was like against the laws of physics that was in the film, which is pretty interesting. Um, so, let's see. Some of the... I'll let Lee, the, the cinephile... Just, just to, so, like, and it's that question there. Like, I can think of two scenes in the movie where one seems to honor this promise and one seems to break it pretty badly. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But, but one of the ways in which, like, well, t two, two of the really cool ways in which the movie did, did live up to this promise of the physics is good is, remember the, so, so if you haven't seen the movie, there's a part where they, they go near a black hole and there's this really beautiful image of like this this sort of black like black sphere uh, surrounded by this like glowing halo, and uh, you can draw it. And what, like it's part of a movie where they're um, they're, they're near a black hole for whatever reason, and the glowing halo around it is called an accretion. Like it's it, it's well, it's not an accretion disk. It's it's yeah, it's an accretion disk. It's sort of gas that's that's fallen in towards the black hole, but has reached this stable pattern where it's orbiting it. But in the movie, if you remember, like it's it's really it's glowing and it's this weird shape, like it's bent in, it's bent in on itself, and so um, it's not actually totally around the black hole. So this was actually a really cool thing that the animators did, where um, they worked with with Kip Thorne and I, I think some other physicists to actually render what a like actually render what a black hole with an accretion disk, like with this hot gas around it, really would look like. And the reason that it's like bent in and it's not just a perfect disk, is because of general relativity and the fact that the light rays coming off this object are bent. So when like, you look at that object, what should just be a disk where you see half of it and the other half is behind the black hole, you actually see, like, I, I don't know, like more than 180 degrees of the black hole. You see stuff that's technically like, behind it, but the light rays are bent, so you see around it. And so that's really, and like a paper was actually pub. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Um, but there was actually like a scientific paper published out of this fact that they rendered it, and that's super cool. And then there was something else in the movie that they did that I, I thought was cool, where like I think like someone's at, I think Matthew McConaughey is at the board, and he's like explaining how they can gain more time by sitting near a black hole, and if they sit near a black hole, time will pass more slowly with respect to somewhat like the space station sitting far from the black hole. And so that was a really cool way for them to like actually take a basic concept of relativity and like use it for plot device in the movie. 
where they break the promise is the thing at the end where like the dude is floating through like a lot <laughs> oh yeah yeah there's nothing happens <laughs> it's a great movie you should see it uh, yeah me neither actually I still haven't seen Gravity <laughs> um, this, actually I, I just wanted to tell a quick story uh, I, I was an undergrad in college when Interstellar came out and I was actually taking a class in general relativity at the time and uh, my professor who was watching with me was like, wait, like, this is wrong. You know, this, uh, th this planet they land on, sp minor spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> is actually like, um, you know, the, 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 time, uh, the time slowdown on the planet is too strong, you know, that this is wrong. But then he, he went back and he did the actual calculation. And it turns out that they contrived the planet to be exactly on what's called the innermost stable circular orbit of this uh, black hole. This is the, uh, the closest you can be to the black hole and still actually orbit around it without spiraling into the black hole. Uh, and so it was exactly on that point. And Kip Thorne probably did that calculation <laughs> and you know, told them, you know, this is exactly how much time slows down at that point. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah, yes. So, love has a fifth dimension, so <laughs> spoiler alert. So if people are comfortable with the minor, it's, it's, it's okay. You can say love is the fifth dimension. Can I like talk about why that's a problem? People really, yeah. yeah. So there's a so so this is a the movie ends with the idea that like you can reach back through. Sp that you can like, there's a thing involving reaching through space and time to the past and changing something. And that is, at least the way that they show it in the movie, not actually possible. Like the, one, the closest you can get to it is technically, I think, in general relativity, you can build really weird scenarios where you have closed time-like loops. But yeah, like, like there's, there's this, Basically, where you're actually like moving forward in time and then back in time, but a these things are so sort of contrived that they're mathematically possible, but could only ever happen like within an event horizon, so a place where you never see it. And b, um, they they just don't don't ex don't exist. And also, no love is not the fifth dimension. Yes, so, but you. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the coolest things that came out of the uh, Large Hadron Collider was the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, I think this is like 2013 or something. Uh, and basically got the Nobel Prize, got the Nobel Prize. yeah. Um, and this is such a huge discovery because uh, before that, we didn't really know where like our mass comes from. Um, like why, why do I have mass and why does the Earth have mass and why do you have mass? Right? Where does that come from? Uh, and particle physicists love, they're, they're like, uh, I, I, was gonna, I was thinking to myself, they, they're like children, right? They're, they're like, you know, but why? <laughs> and then you give them an answer, and then they're like, but why? <laughs> and then you have to drill down uh, as far as you can go, and it turns out that in particle physics, there's this thing called the Higgs field. It's just this, like, uh, just think of it as, like, numbers everywhere in space. Um, and everything... Uh, most most particles uh, interact with this Higgs field, um, and it's this interaction that gives you mass, right? That uh, uh, yeah gives you gravity and gives you mass. And uh, previous to that, you know, it was just elegant mathematics that worked and explained all the things that we already knew. But uh, this theory did one more thing, which is that it predicted that there would be an additional particle that we'd never seen before called the Higgs boson. And uh, the Large Hadron Collider managed to produce these Higgs bosons. They managed to see these. And so that's direct evidence that this Higgs field theory is actually true. Uh, and so that's how we know.
Oh, yeah, so the, the Large Hadron Collider um, is this ring that's underground. Uh, it's like miles in diameter. I don't actually know how big it is. Uh, but uh, you basically shoot a bunch of particles uh, very close to the speed of light, like 99.9999% the speed of light, and you collide them into each other. And it turns out that when you smash particles into each other, uh, they produce uh, lots of other different kinds of particles. Uh, and you can learn a lot, a lot about particles that way by measuring the things that are produced by these collisions. Yeah, it, it, when they slam together, it essentially reveals their parts, the, the particles that made them. Uh, in the same way, if you took two race cars and you speed them up and you slam them together, and you get like a carburetor going flying that way and brake pads flying that way. When, when intrinsically, we may not be able to look inside the car, but we want to figure out what's inside the car, we slam two cars together and see the parts that go flying. It's the same thing for particles. And so they're able to accelerate these particles with enormous energy. So when this thing's running, it's using like some substantial amount of the energy of like France to run this, to get these things accelerated to these very, very, very high speeds. And, uh, and then they slam them together and see, see the parts that come, come out of it. But yeah, particle physics is cool, but in order to do it, you need these enormous teams. There's like thousands of researchers working on this all together, and it's costing a ton of money. And I don't know, big science gets bigger and costs more and needs more people, so. And also, produce, it just produces the, the but why, just more and more questions happen. So like when the, right before the Higgs was found, there were, there's this great documentary about this. If you're interested in learning more about particle physics, there's a documentary called Particle Fever that's on Netflix. And it's great because A, it, talk, it explains like particle physics really well, but uh, B, it like follows the lives of two scientists and it like follows their day to day, like just, what they do and, and what their like life experience is like and just like what does a scientist actually do in, or a particle physicist do when they wake up in the morning and, and, and go to work. Um, but something they talk about in the movie is that they follow, they follow this group of theorists at Princeton who their job while the, while the experimentalists uh, in, in S Switzerland are trying to actually find these particles, their job is to predict, the theorists are trying to predict what they look like and like try to solve certain problems in particle physics. And they talk in the movie about how like uh, there's a group of people that predict like, okay, it's going to be, the Higgs is going to be this massive. Like it's going to be more like pretty massive and that will mean that particle physics is one way. And then this other group of people are like, no, it's going to be much less massive than that which would answer like these other questions really well. So they both have ideas that would answer questions really well. And the actual, when we actually found the Higgs, its actual energy was like smack dab in the middle between the two. And nobody, at least as, as far as I know still, now, like still people aren't exactly sure what that means. And so they want to keep running it and, and upgrade it to higher energies to, um, to like see if they can find more particles that explain this. So the, the questions ju just keep coming, basically. Yeah, and I guess one more thing to add on quickly is that the Large Hadron Collider isn't just here to search for the Higgs boson. We found that already. Uh, as of late, they've been looking for candidates for dark matter. They've been looking for evidence for uh, these theories like called supersymmetry. Um, and what's interesting is that there has been no results out of the Large Hadron Collider in the last few years. And this is sort of like sent particle physicists into a panic thinking, you know, why aren't we finding particles? Uh, something's wrong. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's unclear right now. Uh, but it's just more questions for a scientist's answer. Just one, other, no, sorry, just one other thing, like, although that sends scientists into panic, this is an important lesson that, like, in science, if you are looking for an answer and you don't find something, that's also valuable. It's so, like part of what the, like, the, the results from the, the Large Hadron Collider have done is like, think of like, like parameter space, which is just a, a, a term for like, there are a bunch of numbers that describe like the, the laws of particle physics. And, if, and you, the, if the numbers are a certain value, then you have this kind of physics and if they're a certain value, they're another kind. And so before the LHC, we didn't really have a great idea of large parts of this. And so basically when you get all these non-detections, it rules out huge 
swath swaths of parameter space. And so you like have an idea, well, I, you know, either we're in this increasingly smaller and smaller range of allowed space, or things are totally different. Yeah. So like, it's okay if you don't get a result when you're a scientist. Like if you get a non-detection, that, that's still valuable. Yeah. That's a really good question. Magnets. Magnets. Um, essentially, it's a big electromagnetic tube. So if you think, let's pretend this is a bar magnet. Um, there's another one. Let's, we've got two bar magnets. So when they're close together and we have the two positive ends of the bar magnets, they repel. Like they push away when I try and push them close together. So usually the particles that they're accelerating through this big tube, which as Dylan was saying, is this big ring. So ah, I've got, I don't have enough hands here. No more black hole. Um, so it's this big tube, this big ring that uh, sits right across the border between France and Switzerland because they both wanted it in their countries. <laughs> and so it's partially in France and partially in Switzerland. Um, in the Alps. And this tube is made up of lots of essentially coils of wire that act as electromagnets. So you stick a, a bunch of charged particles in, we'll say, uh, protons. A bunch of protons that each have plus charges in them. And then you turn on your electromagnet where this side is giving you uh, a repelling force and this side is giving you an attractive force. So it starts pulling and moving the proton along. And then you turn off those coils of wire and now you turn on these so it, it's now the, that plus charge is moved here and it gains a little bit more force and a little bit more acceleration. And you keep doing that. And you keep doing it and it gets faster and it gets faster and it gets faster until it's going 99.99% the speed of light or whatever. As much energy as you can put into it that you're flipping on and flipping off these currents which are causing an electromagnetic repulsion force essentially that's propelling this thing forward. So that's essentially what's happening. And then it goes, and then they have another coil that's sending protons back this way. And then they're like, all right guys. And then they slam into each other. They let the railroad tracks merge onto the same thing and they go boom. And then this proton hits this proton, and then we see what makes up protons, quarks, or if it uses a different particle or something like that. But this is essentially the, the premise that all particle colliders are built on, is accelerating things through ma electromagnetic forces and then slamming them into each other. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry, my illustration. I, there's a reason I'm not an artist. Uh, we can take one more question before it's sleepy time. Gentleman in the back. Okay. The question is, do you want to have to take this mic? Sure. Okay. The question is, the stars that were observed outside, I hope most of you got to look through the telescopes at least at some point tonight. Uh, one of the objects, I think, the Pleiades, are about four million light years away. And so the light from the stars, what's that? Oh, 400 light years. Pleiades are only 400 light years? Oh. Pleiades are only 400 light years. Away. So the light that was coming from those stars, uh, do we think it came directly to us in a straight line, or did it wiggle and waggle because of different fields in between us and it? And Max will handle this. Uh, 
So for, for the stars that are 400 million light years away, they almost certainly zigzagged at least a little bit, um, the, the light as it came here. For the closer ones, uh, there's less of an opportunity for things to be in the way. Uh, and I can think of, of two reasons that would cause the light uh, to zigzag a, a little bit. Um, the, the first one is dust. So um, there's lots of dust in between stars uh, in the galaxy uh, and also in between other galaxies. And, and so in, in any direction you look, there'll be some amount of dust. Uh, the further away you look, so the further away a star is, uh, the more dust there could be in the line of sight. And what happens when light hits uh, a little piece of dust um, is it can get scattered. So um, the same way that uh, if you have a really uh, dusty house, uh, not that I'm suggesting that you do, uh, but, but if you have a really dusty house and you have a, a beam of light coming in, uh, to your room and, and you knock up some of the dust, you, you can see that piece of dust. Um, and so that, that same thing happens uh, in space. And so in your house, what's happened is the, the light comes from the sun in through the window, hits the piece of dust, and then uh, that light gets scattered in, into your eye. And so the, the same thing happens in space. Uh, the light hits the piece of dust, and then it gets scattered in another direction. So, so this scattering does change its angle, but that, that kind of comes to the, the second thing that I'm thinking of, uh, which is gravitational lensing. And so uh, the same way that we, we had our black hole, um, that you, you basically just redrew the black hole. I did, I did. <laughs> <laughs> the LHC, the black hole. And, and so, um, so when, when we were talking about interstellar, um, there, there was this nice picture of this disc. You don't need to. Okay. <laughs> a nice picture of this disc, and we were saying that this, uh, what we saw up here, was actually coming from the other side of the disc. Uh, so you can imagine, um, if, if we're the observer, um, uh, us astronomers often draw a little, a little eye. Here's a little eye, and, and that's one thing we're okay at drawing. But, and the light comes into the eye. And so if, if there's, this is the, the most extreme example, and, and we'll talk about what happens less. If lights, if there's a star over there, and then you have this black hole here, um, as the light comes towards the black hole, 